Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Whatnots Captain's Log number 141. I am super excited to be be here. This is a, a special one for, for us. We have a special guest on the show. Uh, so let's get into introductions right away. My name is Kyle Springer, and I am joined, as always, by Melissa Wilkinson. Hello. And our special guest this week is writer and podcaster Paul Bay. Oh, welcome. Thanks for having me on. Uh, nice to finally meet Zoom to Zoom, <laughs> digital yeah. face to digital faces <laughs> after all these years of you supporting the Black Tapes on your podcast. It's been a long time coming, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, I so back when we started the Whatnots, we recorded a few things to like find our footing and we never really published it. But the very first podcast that we p published out to the public was on the black t t tapes which is something that you c created uh and we covered it multiple times we've uh we've lo looked at I i've looked at uh tannis which was another story from pacific northwest and we covered mm -hmm. marvels that that you've worked on so your your name has popped up multiple multiple t times here on on <laughs> on the whatnot so thank you thank you for stopping in mm -hmm. no no I'm, 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 this is my uh, pleasure i've been looking forward to this uh since we uh, connected <laughs> online about uh you, you possibly having me on so I'm, it's a pl it's my pleasure abs absolutely um so we know some of the stuff that you've worked on and who you are but let's take a step back for people who might not know who are you and what do you do <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I am Paul Bay. I am former uh, youth pastor, former high school teacher, former stand-up comedian, former television host, uh, former actor, turned podcaster because wow. I because I was not good at any of that other stuff. So I had to keep <laughs> uh, keep trying to you know you find your thing eventually. Uh, no, so uh, we my friend Terry and I, Terry Miles and I. So so you mentioned tennis. Uh, I have no uh, involvement in Tannis, except for mm -hmm. uh, Terry created Tannis on his own without me. Um, uh, this wonderful series, if you haven't listened to it, it's, it's, it's incredible. Uh, cosmic horror, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he used one of our, the characters we made together, Nick Silver, uh, in yeah. the Tannis world. And he made, so he just made me an executive producer, <laughs> which he didn't have to do. Uh, <laughs> but it was nice okay. of him. But it, it, it makes me look like I actually did something on the thing. Uh, <laughs> the, the, only, the only thing that meant was in season one... Um, he let me listen to all the episodes before publishing. And that, that oh, was okay. it. Okay, cool. Um, well, the first two. And then after that, I would listen to it and I would suggest things here and there. But that, that was it. Um, so, but him and I became friends because he was, he's a well-known indie film director here in Canada, uh, especially mm. on the West Coast. And I was, in his, I was acting in his first movie. Um, oh, a wow. very <laughs> low-budget affair. Um, and, and so we became friends from that. And then one day he, he knew I wrote... And he said, you want to write something together? And I said, sure, because he was between movies. He had like a two week break uh, and he writes very quickly. Um, so I had to catch up to his speed. And so he goes, give me your yeah. best five best ideas. So I gave it to him. And I had one about an 80s arcade. I had another one about a high school. But I had one called the Black Tape, just tape singular about a sure. ghost hunter who doesn't believe in ghosts. And he's got one mysterious cassette. And it was supposed to be the first of three trilogies. And Terry's like, let's write that one. We wrote that in five days. The full screenplay. Wow. <laughs> like I, I like I did the I did the action lines and the, the action and he filled in the dialogue. Next thing we knew, we had like a hundred we had a hundred and ten pages screenplay. And so he gave it to his agent. Uh we we're all excited about it. And then two years later we realized, yeah, his agent's not taking it out. <laughs> and so oh, at the end of 2014, um uh, uh, uh things take a weird turn. I I I injured my back. Uh and I say this mm -hmm. I was lucky to injure my back. Because Terry came to visit me at my house because he wanted to, you know, just check up on the sick guy. And then he goes, you know, uh, we should still think, consider doing a podcast together. And I didn't want to, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of work, as you know, coming up with content to just talk off the, off the cuff. For sure, yeah. So, so out of frustration, I just said, well, too bad we can't turn the black tapes into a podcast. And Terry's eyes lit up and he's, you know, he's a film director. He's like, why not? I'm like, what do we do? Like, just like he goes, yeah, we hire actors. We just do it like a movie. And didn't, it didn't work at the time, but then all of a sudden we thought of Serial. I'm like, if we can insert a journalist right. uh, who's, who crosses journalistic boundaries uh, and makes herself mm -hmm. the center of the story, then we got something. 
Uh, and then Terry's like, let's do it like War of the Worlds. And I'm like, I was totally on board with that idea. Like, let's, if, if we do the War of the Worlds thing uh, if, uh, with our actor friends, they're all our friends. Uh, they sign on. Uh, right. They agree. Like, let's just pretend it's real. And that's what ended up happening. And uh, that's, that's wonderful. How the, and it became the black tapes all of a sudden. Um, yeah. And so it was just accident after accident because his his agent wasn't doing the, his former agent wasn't doing the job for us. <laughs> <laughs> and and to be honest, to uh, reading that again, had his ad a, agent taken it out, it wouldn't have become anything. It was just it was just Doctor Strand in the forest looking at this cabin mystery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's, it's like it's, it's like him looking for his uh, the, the 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 missing dead wife trope. We had that in there because it was going to lead to him gotcha. uh, going to his Big Sur and looking up this, at this old nunnery. Uh, and it, it, was, it was scary. The, the screenplay was scary, but I've seen I've seen that version on screen several times. Interesting. A ghost hunter in the forest and that kind of thing. So what we ended up coming up with, I think, was a lot more compelling. What what you guys stumbled mm -hmm. on, yeah, really seemed to be kind of at the start of this big ch 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 trend, because uh, you you yeah. mentioned serial, and that was like this investigative journalism, and then yeah, there was this big boom in fiction audio podcasts, and you guys seem to be right there at at the start of like we're you know we're gonna have some riff on that formula there. So, yeah, I like like like, um, like fake um, fake radio announcers, journalists. They, they've been there like welcome to Night Vale's a fake, mm -hmm. right. so, a small yeah. town journalist, um, yeah. uh, not journalist, but, you know, a small town radio show. Um, but uh, uh, Terry was like, you know, we should we should really hurry because uh, uh, with the advent of cereal, uh, he was convinced someone was going to beat us to the punch. He goes, someone else is going to do this. I'm like, no way, man. No one's, who's going to think of this? And so he's like, well, let's just hurry. So we did it as fast as we could. Uh, got it out in May 2015. I think just maybe six months later, Limetown came out. But they had been yeah. in production. Oh. Like having, you know, uh, I know now. They, they were producing theirs the same time we were producing ours. Wow. Right? Yeah. I think I think theirs might have taken a little longer just because they had that helicopter sound they had to record. I don't know. I'm just, I'm joking, but you know what I mean. Like they they had other things to do, and it's it's. Uh, I know Bright Sessions came out right after that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this whole wave. Aaron Mankey was making Lore at the same time, and he came out yeah. just just a few months before us. And so I don't know if you remember this, but in the first year we came out, 2015, Alex Reagan, our fictional journalist, in character interviewed the real Aaron Mankey. About his new novel. Yes, that's right? awesome. Yeah, he was he was trying to grow lore. We we're trying to grow the black taste. So we sort of came up together, and it's it's uh that class of 2015 is is quite strong. But we were, <laughs> we were really lucky. Like we were very very lucky. Yeah. It's just it's just luck and timing. Like that we just happened to be mm -hmm. looking to make an audio drama at that time when Serial came out, and you know and and there weren't too many um there was a ton of audio drama coming out of the, you know from the BBC of course. There's a huge history of that. But in terms mm -hmm. of in the podcast form there wasn't too much yet uh, of the journalists mm -hmm. searching out a mystery. And so we, there's, a, there's a handful of us, a half dozen or maybe a dozen, who got really lucky that uh, there, was, there was an audience starving for that, for that kind of content, and we happened to fill it. Um, if we were to put out the black tapes now, I always say, I don't know how well it would do. Um, like, like in terms of, because, you know, we have, there's yeah. so much competition now. It'd be really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I know that because I put out the big loop two years ago and it has just a fraction of the audience that the Black Tapes has. Um, Interesting. Even though, yeah, so it's just, it's just mm. a much more crowded field. So we're, again, it's, it's, uh, I just want to impress the point that we got very lucky <laughs> with the timing. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Yo, I, I'm curious. You, you mentioned you gave T T Terry your five best ideas. How did you come up with the idea for the black tape? Like what, what, what inspired you to, to write that down as like, this is one of my best, best ones here. Um, so that story came when the black tape came out, uh, black tapes came out, uh, a bunch of my former students, uh, who I connect with on Facebook, uh, when I, when I was on Facebook a lot, uh, they would uh, DM me saying, hey, Mr. Bay, isn't these your stories from the classroom you used to tell us? So every when I, I taught for 12 years and every Halloween, I was notorious for this one event every Halloween called oh. the Hour of Horror. And every okay. Halloween, I would make up a whole hour worth of new horror stories. And it was a guarantee. Like you come into my classroom, I'm going to scare the shit out of you. 
Even if you're like a cynical grade 12 cool kid, I'm gonna sh I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure you don't sleep this weekend. <laughs> That's awesome. Because you'll be thinking about this. So they all come in like challenging me, like I dare you, right? And I I still pull it off. Like it, it, the school was Templeton. I remember um the high school's Templeton. If you went to their Facebook group when it started, there was a rumor that Templeton was haunted. Uh, especially the third <laughs> girls' bathroom. They said you know there's a in the third stall at a 3:15 exactly. You see uh, this certain shadow. And then one of my former students, Julia, says, no, 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 LOL, Mr. Bay made that up. I was there when he made up that story about that kid who died in that third floor bathroom. Why would Mr. Bay know about the third floor girl's bathroom? Think about it. And then someone else is like, no, 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 my mom's brought out the news clipping of the murder, which I made up. I printed it. I made it up. Like, it's just so. Oh, wow. So everyone thinks these stories I made up are real. And anyways, so one one um, Halloween, I was having trouble with this one class because uh some of those kids I'd taught twice previously. So they were on to all my tricks, my narrative tricks, sure. or my, my uh, uh, sleight of hand, right? So I came in, I wheeled in the VCR and the TV, and I had a black VHS tape. I go, hey guys, I'm not going to scare you this year, uh, but I do want your help. Um, my friend in the States, uh, uh, he's a paranormal researcher, and I always pretend I don't believe it. I go, he's, you know, he's out there. But he's got these yeah. cases that he can't solve. So let's put it in. Maybe we'll watch these cases. They're really scary. I got to warn you. They're really scary. And you guys can help. I, he knows I teach a gifted class. So you guys can help. And you can feel the kids just getting really amped up. And then, <laughs> you know, they see this fuzzy screen. And, and then I hit pause. I'm like, oh, before I play, let, let, let me say this. And I tell a story. And it led to story after story. And I kept pressing play. And it was like, it was like 45 minutes of me almost starting that video. And then at the 50 minute the, of me telling scary stories as we're about to do this, because I'd make up stories like, oh, by the way, this guy and I went camping once. And you ever hear about the Sasquatch? And this, something was throwing rocks into the <laughs> pond, into the lake while we're fishing. We're like, what yeah. the hell is that? Then we hear a whale. And you can see this, this uh, student's like really free, tensing up. Anyways, I, I, I press play and it just said, happy Halloween. And that was, it was, that oh. was the black tape. Um, Amazing. And then, so, so I wrote it down saying, yeah, you know, Ghost Hunter doesn't believe in ghosts collection of black tapes right um huh. and you'll solve them one every movie uh and then when terry said we, but terry almost wanted the arcade uh an 80s arcade uh story oh. right? about well, a bunch you, of, you would uh, have liked uh, that one yeah it's, just, it's like it's not even scary it's just a, just a, a bunch of guys finding love and their status in an arcade <laughs> Right. As teenagers okay, in, in the 80s. And then he's like, oh, that nice. sounds really funny. I'm like, yeah, let's do that one. And he goes, but the black tape, I keep coming back to the black tape. I'm like, OK, let's do that one. So thank God we didn't do the arcade one. <laughs> I don't think comedy <laughs> was a big thing in 2015 in audio drama. Not not so, so much. No. Yeah. M mm. M M M Melissa, I, I think you you would have liked that uh, that arca arcade one, especially with your <laughs> knowledge of Polybius. And, and stuff yes. like that. So. <laughs> you just got to combine the two and just do a, a fake true crime podcast entirely about Polybius. And you're all set. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, let's let's move on a bit to the big loop. Uh, that that one is 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 one you mm -hmm. went on to create, I believe, by yourself. Right. You you wrote and and yeah. did, did all of the, that stuff. Yeah, so I've I've not heard all of that when I've jumped around a, a, a bit and I've listened to some of those, but those ones are fantastic too. What was the idea behind that one, and what what made you uh, want to pursue that sto sto story or those stories, I should say? Yeah, so that came out of um, uh, like I said, I, I always keep a list of stories. Um, uh -huh. and, you know, it's Terry's like, give me your best ideas. So I, I looked at my list one day, and I had like, and Terry had been bugging me because he went to do tennis, he went to do rabbits. And he's like, it's your turn, buddy. Like, why don't you put out one of your podcasts? And I'm like, that's a lot of work to do. Mama. I don't want to I don't want to have to do your what you do with all the technical <laughs> stuff. I don't want to do that. Uh, I just want to write. And then uh, one day I noticed uh, I, I had like 72 story ideas. I'm like, what am I going to do with these? And I've been bitten to the punch so many times coming out with a, a script idea and then seeing it come out in a the theater. Like, I'm like, you know what? I, I should probably do what Terry says and do an anthology. He didn't say do an anthology, but I thought mm -hmm. maybe I could do an anthology and get all my ideas out there. And my financial, uh, the, the financial structural idea, the hope would be that uh, movie companies, production companies would approach me and ask me for individual episodes to turn into movies. Interesting. Right? So if, oh. if, I, if I sell even that's one, that's, that's more money than a season of black tapes in terms of profit, right? So uh, just letting you know, we didn't make a lot of money. <laughs> so that's, I thought that's a, that's a good idea. So I did that. 
And then it happened, like a, a, a TV network came in and it was in development for two years, uh, a certain, oh, wow. yeah. cer certain stories. And uh, it's back to me now. There's, we'll see what's happening to it. But yeah, it, it, it worked out. So that was the idea behind that, just to get my stories out there. And uh, just, cr you know, you always hear this all the time these days, create IP, right? But I, right, wanted, yeah. to I, want, I wanted to create <laughs> yeah. and own something that people wanted. Um, yeah, and I, I was very lucky for, it, for that to work out. Do you have a story in the big loop that you are particularly proud of and be like, man, if, 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 if you guys should listen to any of them, check this one out. Um, oh, God. I mean, I, I think they're, it's, they're, it's they're a all tie. Your, your, your children, right? They're all like, I yeah, love them yeah. all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the one I'm most proud of uh, uh, might be um, uh, 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 All God's Children. Um, okay. because I, it, it, it's, it's the one where it's, it's the one where I, I had trouble explaining I would never be able to explain it, but it's, 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 you know, as a former pastor, as a former Christian, I'd always wanted to tell that story of how I went through, left faith, went through this valley of darkness, went, and I came out the other end, very, very bitter and angry about my Christianity, mm -hmm. but then went through another valley of death and, uh, uh, uh the darkness and healing. And now I can look back and say, oh, you know what? That was a very valuable like, thing. And I could see sure. why it's valuable to people. And I wish I could say sorry to all my Christian friends who I, ins I probably insulted every single one of them at least a dozen times uh, when I became through my atheist phase. Uh, because they would sure. reach back. Of course, you know, I, 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 I was a big Christian. So I, when I left, they all tried to bring me back to the faith. And I, I didn't react very well to that. So it's sort of like my way of telling my friends and my, the people around me, uh, you know, I, I'm not that way anymore. I understand why this is important to you and it's ambiguous right but i understand why faith yeah, is valuable yeah. um but but also i want to explain how it looks from my end so you know th that story about a, a man whose life is falling apart is the story of job um but i also want to mix mm -hmm. a, a cthulhu uh, uh imagery and mythology with the baby <laughs> octopus squid uh lethal monster baby right and you know just yeah, the, just awesome. the uh, uh how absurd it can be this life sometimes and up uh, what it's like for us to love somebody and have passion for something in this absurdity. Uh, so that's the closest I've been able to capture that feeling, that episode. Interesting. Um, it's not the most popular episode. That's the episode that confused the most people. They're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> you know, he's born, then there's an Elon Musk figure trying to figure out an octopus thing, a bodysuit. Uh, and it's all about his faith. It's a guy talking about his faith and how he believes in God at the end. Um, but, that's fascinating, uh, yeah, so that that's the one I'm most proud of it is because I, I would not be able to tell that story. Um, that's the one when a production company asked me, how would we do this? I'm like, I don't want that as a movie or TV show. I just want I just want to keep it as an audio drama. Um, that's the one mm -hmm. you can't touch. So, yeah, that's that's that's. Um, yeah, uh, that's the one I'm most proud of. There you go. Melissa. Nice. Did you? You? I, yes. I know you've also been ch ch checking out some of the the big big loop. What were the ones that that that, that stood out to you? Oh, the one about is it the Cassini space mission? Yeah. Where it's one woman left alive and the AI is trying to cheer her up. Yeah. That's ve that's very touching. It's it's funny. I've really enjoyed the big loop. The ones I've listened to so far, they're toned very well. Like they've got a little. A little humor to them, just enough, and just enough eeriness and sadness, and there's a lot packed in there. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Uh, that one's called "You," and you know, if I could redo, yes. if I could redo that one again, I would take myself out of it. Like in season one, you notice the narrators. I called myself Michael Kim because I wanted mm -hmm. to, ah. you know, remove myself. You know, uh, but um, in season two, I just say Paul Bay because right? my my mm -hmm. my, <laughs> my agent my agent was like, "Why do you do that?" I'm like, I don't know. I didn't want to be involved. But he was like, everyone knows it's you. I'm like, that's true. <laughs> um, so I just changed it back to Paul Bay and I'm too lazy to change the intro with the Michael Kim stuff. But that one, I wish I had not done the, I was still in that This American Life mode where I was trying to imitate yeah. them and sure, uh, yeah. inserting the, uh, the interviewer in it. Uh, where in season two, it's just all the other person. Um, I think I would have I focused that. But that, that story came out of a thing where uh, one, I was sitting next to my wife. Uh, I think we were a few years into a relationship and I realized, wow, I, I actually healed. I used to be married previously, divorced, went through a very bitter phase again. Um, mm -hmm. And I realized, oh, wow, I'm happy again. Like one day I just realized, oh my God, I, I'm not the divorced healing guy. I'm actually another 
happier person. I'm happier than I ever thought I'd be. This sucks because we're going to die one day and I'm going to lose all this. So my thought, oh. my thought went immediately oh. to that. And so I was trying to catch yeah. it. I was trying to catch that thing. What it feels like to what it feels like to just love someone incredibly with all your being. And then knowing one day we lose it all. Like this meant nothing. Like we just yeah. we just mm -hmm. we lose it all. We're here for a moment. Then we lose it. And it's, it's, it, it sounds awful when I say it that way. So I thought it's better to dramatize it because you get it's more of a feeling. All right. Um, I don't like philosophizing on that or, or hearing philosophy or reading philosophy on that anymore. It's, it's more like just just trying to convey a feeling and then knowing that other people feel that same thing. It, it's a, sure. it's a, com a comfort in itself. Right. So, um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. As, as so it's great to hear that. Thank you. As an, an art, art student, yeah, that's something that I connect with, too, because it's like I can make stuff and I can have my own ideas and stuff of what I want to convey. But people will put their own meanings in things and connect to it in their own way. So if you can just like lead them to like, hey, it's going to be something over there and you'll you'll connect to some feeling on that side side then it's like hey if 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 they made it in that in that direction then you you made something successful so yeah, yeah thank stuff. you yeah I, it's, I remember someone telling me or maybe i read it but something about like uh an artist doesn't doesn't talk about the truth or doesn't show you the truth it just leads you the way to a, a way of looking oh. at something a, a way of looking at a, a, an, an aspect of truth um and I always thought that's an interesting way to tell. Like, I, I don't know if that's true or not, or uh, uh, how wise that is, but for storytelling, that that's effective. I think. Yeah, yeah. One thing that I uh, that that I appreciate about the big big loop is that all of these sto story or most of them have some like supernatural or magical realism or sci-fi something mm -hmm. in there, but that's not really what those stories are about. Are about they are more of these like more emotional hu human stories um which which i i think makes them really really powerful so well, thanks, great Kyle. work yeah <laughs> <laughs> thanks mm -hmm. great work indeed and now for a quick word from our sponsors and our sponsors would be us here at the whatnots uh if you guys did not know we have multiple podcasts here at the whatnots you guys can find out more information on our website which is thewhatnots.com, as well as your favorite podcasting platform of choice. Just type in The Whatnots and all of our shows will pop up right there. If you like what we do, patreon.com slash the whatnots is where you can support us for as little as a dollar a month. We have a three dollar section uh, with all kinds of exclusive content. Uh, and be on the lookout for our next one. We are creating bingo cards for one of our other podcasts, which we are hoping to gamify a bit. So we're coming up with a bunch of movie and TV tropes and comic tropes. Uh, to fill in those squares and as we cover a bunch of movies and TV shows we'll be playing bingo with 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 those I think it should be a lot of fun uh, and a big shout out to our Patreon supporters at the $5 tier and above. Uh, so thank you to Sam and thank you, Greg Miller. We appreciate it a lot. Uh, and it, it has been wonderful that you guys support us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, we do some live streams on Twitch at twitch.com tv slash the whatnots we are usually there each wednesday night friday night and sunday afternoon uh, so be on the lookout for all of that you guys can subscribe to our channel there but if you have amazon prime you also have twitch prime uh, you just have to link your account which is super simple and then you get a free subscription to give out each month uh, and we would love that to be us here at the whatnots because that means we can make bigger and better content for you down the road but that is about it for housekeeping and all the, all that sponsor stuff so let's get back to the show do i um do you have any more stories for the big loop that you're working on or are coming down the down the road uh not at no, it's i'm so busy with the tv stuff now uh, and i'm in that world and that pays the bills so uh <laughs> it's really hard and with the other podcasts i'm working on it's really hard for me to find the time for the big loop um and i think i have enough stories out. i have 12 stories out right now well 13 because uh, i don't know if you listen to 
I put out another episode this past February as part mm -hmm. of London Fashion Week. It's the first audio drama yes, to be as part yeah. of a runway show. Um, and so that was that was really exciting uh, to put out another Big Loop episode, um, a mini episode. Uh, but I, I don't see myself putting out any more Big Loop unless I'm suddenly... Okay. Uh, like I, I always hope to put out a Valentine's one and a Christmas one. Right? I just, I just, I just <laughs> don't have fun. the time for it right now. But I, I've always wanted to do yeah. a Christmas thing. Uh, it's, it's in me. But I, I just, I just don't have the time right now. That's fair. That's that's a great place to have it to have that open ended anthology option that you can pick up and return to just whenever the idea is ready for that. Yeah, that's what's great about anthologies, right? If I have, if I have another six mm -hmm. ideas. Boom, I get it done, right? It's, it's, it's so easy to do. Well, I, well, easy compared to like TV, which takes uh, forever. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. Uh, well, before we get into the TV stuff, we also have to ask about Marvels. Because uh, we're, we're big Marvel fans here at, at the <laughs> yeah. Whatnots. We just got done watching Falcon and the Winter Soldier and all of that stuff. And that was a wonderful show. Uh, so how did that deal come about and what was it like working with Marvel in in that capacity i gotta i gotta really give it to um uh there's a, a gentleman named uh uh harry go from marvel and his team mm -hmm. uh they they really thought well we want to tell an aud audio drama of the of the kurt Busiek, alex ross classic marvels that series yeah and they go we need it's impressionistic it's it's you know it's more about it's less about the heroes it's more about the people so who are we going to go to? And they asked around and they asked people, who are the serious independent audio creators? Who are the ones that can do it? And, and that's how they got Lauren Shippen, Misha Stanton right, and me yeah. together. It's an right? all-star cast. To all, cast yeah. us, right? uh, I think there were other people in the mix and they, we, they asked us to pitch ideas. So we all pitched our different takes on it. Um, my take, I guess I'm allowed to say this. My take was uh, <laughs> uh, uh, about the guy, uh, the, the lead character's going through a divorce and losing hope oh. and then galactus shows up which becomes like a god metaphor <laughs> right like so it's about me sure. i wrote myself into the series right which is not what yeah. marvels is about but i thought well I, it's this is a, it comes a point where you're like ah uh, I, I could tell that story but other people could tell that original story better than me right sure. uh but i could tell my story better than anyone else so that's what I did. I pitched my story and, and like sort of shaped the Marvel universe around me. Uh, but Lauren <laughs> Shippen came up with the best idea. Like she, she just, hers is just fantastic. So hers, I read hers. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, you guys made the right choice. <laughs> just that's uh, awesome. So we, we, they hired her and they told, when they called me, they said, uh, thanks Paul. Cause we, we got to the finals, uh, Misha, Lauren and me. And they said, uh, uh thanks uh but we're gonna give it to lauren i'm like oh you made the great choice don't worry yeah that's that's fine uh thanks for giving me a chance and they said but would you like to direct and i said uh no because uh there are better <laughs> directors than me uh they go well no you 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 got a good anyways i tried to talk myself out of it and i said i'm not i'm not good, a good director i'm not there's I, i'm just i don't i i i because in the big loop a lot of people self-directed Right, you, the uh, Melissa, okay. the episode you, I wasn't even in the room. Lauren Shippen directed it. Oh. Right? The, the, she directed the Bright Sessions actors. And so I told them that. And they said, who directed uh, Eye of the Lord? I go, well, that was self-directed. They go, no, but who shaped the whole thing? Like who, you know, I go, well, that was a sound guy. Like, I go, no, no, who designed the whole, who put it together? I'm like, oh, that was me. Right? And they go, that was your vision. I go, yeah. They go, that's what a director does. It's their vision. I'm like, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Well, I guess I could do that. And it, was, it, was, it was really funny. And it turned out because I, I don't like to micromanage people. That's why I, I thought directing, you know, telling an actor this or that. And um, turned out it wasn't that at mm -hmm. all. It was just a lot of for fun. Sure, sure. All the work came it's, in it's, casting it's for me. Not the like, OK, one more time, but uh, this time with more jazz, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, more more jazz hands method, man. <laughs> like, yeah. I can imagine that. Um, so yeah, just uh, it, it was it was fantastic. It was just it was a great environment. It, it but it was also great because I got to work with Misha. Like Misha mm -hmm. was in the sound booth behind me all the time, so I knew if I screwed up, well, Misha's got it. Misha knows how to direct too. <laughs> sure. And then Misha would go in my ear. Can we try a take like this? Because they're listening for sound, and 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 also the, they have an idea of story beats, right? Yeah. So I'm like, oh, and and we had we had Lauren's uh incredible script to go off of. So it was it was like I could do no wrong with the talent. Um, they, 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 they yeah. set me up to succeed in the direction field. Oh. 
how hands-on was Marvel or D D D Disney in that process? Did once once they signed the deal, did they just kind of let you guys go and do your thing, or did they did they say certain things were off limits or change things or? Well, um, the script part, they were very like like any Marvel thing. The script was very hands-on. Like very hands-on and, and lauren had to like you know they, you get the notes process it's like tv you get the notes back back right. back and forth uh so that was quite uh laborious i think like any big studio job uh and this is pre amalgamation with disney um okay. sorry okay pre amalgamation with marvel studios so we were working for marvel entertainment in new york not okay. marvel studios gotcha. so the comic division and the movie division were separated at the time uh they amal they, they brought them on all underneath uh feige i think a year later or a few months later, okay. Okay. Uh, after we'd finished, um, which which is probably good because um, I got along when it came to the direction part. I got along with the uh, producers, uh, Harry and their team, so well that they were in the studio every day, like every minute they were there, like watching. But it wasn't like mm -hmm. it wasn't like they're watching over my shoulder. I'd look back all the time. They're smiling. It was just like <laughs> having a buddy. Like they're just enjoying it. Good. Right? And I'm looking there, going, you know, they're paying you for this. And so it was, it was a lot of fun. It's uh, I, I like to think I made it fun for them. But uh, yeah, free lunches, that kind of stuff. It was just, it was just they were very mm -hmm. hands off with it with, for the direction part. Um, you know, it's funny. As I'm saying this, I'm feeling sorry for Lauren then because she basically took, did the hardest part right, um, in terms yeah. of notes. Misha also had a hard part because Misha had to listen to the studio notes on the sound and me. So Misha was getting it from everybody. I, yeah. uh, where me, I was not getting any notes. <laughs> I have to, to tip my hat to Miehesha. I, I, meant, I mentioned this when we covered Marvels on the Review Show, which is another po podcast that, that, that we do here at the Whatnots, that he, that they, they, they made the Invisible Woman sound invisible. And I, I was just b baffled. Like, how, how do you do that? And they nailed it. It was, it was wonderful. Yeah. I was just like, this is amazing. Yeah, and it's weird because, you know, uh, when we're trying to come up with sound, like Misha and I had to work closely together b before we started recording. And Misha's like, what do you want the Silver Surfer to sound like? And we had the pages. I go, I remember going, I want cosmic shimmery. Right? And then, <laughs> what do you do with that? Like, that's, right. <laughs> that's the writer-director line. I go, I want cosmic shimmery. And Misha's like, okay, okay. But Misha's like, I got gotcha. you. And would send me three <laughs> sounds. Zoom, sheen, and I'm like, yeah. can we get more sparkle, more sparkle at the end? Like, I want the feeling of jazz hands all over me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, more jazz, <laughs> more jazzy, and then yeah, and they did it. It never took a long time. Uh, Galactus, I, awesome. I said, I want, I want it to feel like ominous, more ominous, uh, as if you know. It, uh, and then someone had the idea. I can't remember who. One of the producers had the idea of let's let's have Galactus speak in eleven languages. Like a bunch of languages. Oh, we'll need an actor that can do all that, or at least fake it, and then layer it on top of each other. Because in, in reality, if, if a galactic being came down, everyone would hear them in their own language. Sure. Yeah. So we had it. We had it in eleven languages. That actor had to do it so many times, and he was so good. He was wow. incredible. Right. And then, um, and, and we picked the languages that were common in New York at that time. Like that's how much detail we went into. Interesting. Um, I don't think I then, then, realized that that's that's what you guys. Did with yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, you can't hear it, but it has that effect. It has that effect of being global and a global threat uh, when it comes yeah. out. And that comes down to the actor, really. Um, and then uh, uh, with Invisible, with Invisible uh, uh, Sue, Rich Sue, uh, Sue Richards, it was just talking about how we need her to be present, but feeling ghostly, but not ghosty. Right? So what do you do with that? And it takes someone like Misha, who's a genius, to take right. that and go, I know what you're trying to say. Right, because yeah, director language is always very, very vague, very ephemeral, and and Misha has to take my feeling, like I have to mode it the way I am right now, and Misha takes the way what I'm, he what they're hearing me say, and the way I'm saying it, and then puts it into sound, and that is a, that is a rare skill to have, right? So so again, knowing I had Misha behind me from the recording all the way to the end product, I, I wasn't like I was set up to succeed on that, like there's no way I could have failed. That's wonderful. Melissa, I think you had a question about the future of uh, uh, audio drama stuff that, that you wanted to ask. Yeah, kind of going back to what we were talking about at the beginning with black tapes being one of the, uh, the 
forefathers of the modern audio drama movement as we've come to know it. Uh, how have you seen audio dramas grow? Where do you think they're going to go in the future? Do you think they are still as strong as they've been? I know it's something I've never let go of. I'm always excited for a new audio drama. Yeah, I, I you know, I'll be, I, I, I'll be honest. I, I really don't know where it's going to go. Uh, I like seeing, what I do enjoy seeing is people finding it as an outlet to, to create things, right? So you have Absolutely. actors who don't get a chance to go up on stage. Um, there's, all the, there's all these mini gates in every field, right? Like, yeah, they're, they're not, not so much, there's purposeful gatekeepers and purposeful gatekeeping. Like, when I say purposeful, they mean to gatekeep. Uh, it's on purpose. But then there's these micro, small gates, like smaller little barriers to entry. Whether it's like, you know, I hear people say it's, it's, it's uh, uh, there's a low barrier to entry for podcasting, which is true compared to TV, but it's just a, sure, it's yeah. a low, mm-hmm. it's a lower barrier to start, right? But it's still a huge barrier for success or to even be heard. And a, and a computer is not free and the, and the, and the microphone is <laughs> not free. All these things cost money and then, and the Wi-Fi, you know, all that stuff, I, everything costs money. I, and I so, know that pain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got that. You got it. You're trying to pay the bills. You want to, you want to respect everyone's talents so you want to pay everybody like i know every mm-hmm. every audio drama i see i i see some incredible audio dramas and i'm like and i find out they're not paying anybody because they can't they just can't afford it so everyone's doing it for free out of passion i'm like in in a, in 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 an ideal situation everyone would find a way to get paid uh we'll see how right. this apple thing uh, the, the way they're doing these uh the payment system now we'll see how that was... a freemium or premium we'll see how that works out i don't know um, yeah, but I, I think Spotify uh, just just mentioned today that they're starting the same thing that they're they're doing yeah. subscriptions and and stuff like that. So mm. yeah, and there's there's I don't think they're taking anything out of the creator's pocket for that one. We'll see how that goes, right? Oh, wow. So okay. um, interesting. So we'll we'll, we'll see. you know from it's hard because I I see I like I'm not a purist. I'm not an audio drama purist. I, I someone who openly admits that I created my first audio drama to bring attention to our screenplay. Right. And then we ended up sure. with mm-hmm. an NBC deal. Right. And it's still black tapes is still going around Hollywood. We're still trying to find a big time showrunner to, to put it on. T- that's our goal to put it on TV. Right. A uh, secret goal inside here is to finish off the rest of uh, six more episodes. We have six more episodes of the black tapes <laughs> and it would complete the cycle. Uh, but we'll, we'll see. Um, I think I think for there's people like me who create audio dramas for IP. So you have a lot of Hollywood writers coming in, tons of them. Uh, with ideas that they can't pitch to the networks yet or or movie yeah. studios, so they create an audio drama and they take it back out there. But then you have audio drama purists who do it just for the love of, like they're not even thinking about the next stage. Um, I've met so many of them, and they're like, "Okay, Paul, can you help me? Because I never even thought I'd get here. Now I'm here. I have agents knocking on my door. What do yeah. I do? And I'm glad what I can use I my <laughs> my knowledge to help those people. Like I like helping those people who suddenly because they get taken okay. advantage of all the time. Um, but apart from that, I, I have no idea. If you're happy just creating things with your friends or if you think of your project as a small community theater and you're going you're gonna to entertain handfuls of people like you know, 25, 25, 100 people at a time and you're very happy with that, that's great. Uh, but yeah. if your goal is to make money and pay everyone equitably, that's, that's a tough call. I don't know, I don't know what the landscape's mm-hmm. going to be. There's so much. Uh, I will say this. Whoever creates, who successfully creates a dramatic comedy, like just, just comedy, not sitcom but an actual comedic audio drama, because it's so hard to do, um, a scripted one, mm-hmm. they're, they're going to kill, right? Like right now, yeah. a lot of the ones that are super funny are over the top. Like they're not realistic t- characters. And I love those ones, right? Like this sounds serious. Sure. Yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah, is, yeah. A, is a parody and it's perfect. It's pitch perfect. Wooden overcoats is hilarious, but it's, it's mm-hmm. like, it's like, it's like, um, it's over the top. Everything's over the top. Whoever can, whoever can nail something like Veep or Curb Your Enthusiasm, okay. that kind of thing, yeah. uh, they're going to they're gonna find it. Someone's going to find that winning formula. Um, yeah, that's, that's okay. the only prediction I could make about the future of audio drama. It's very narrow, but that's all I... I'm not that smart of a guy <laughs> no, when it comes to this. No, that's great. Good stuff. Well, you, I look you... forward to finding that show someday. Yeah. Abs- absolutely. It might be out there. I don't even know, but I might not know about it because there's so yeah. many audio dramas. Yeah, that's that's the wonder of audio dramas is that there's some big ones that you feel like most people in this community have heard of, but then you're always stumbling across something you've never heard of before. It's just 
like a rabbit hole of just the right like podcast. If you like this, you might also like this yeah. recommendations at the bottom of the page or like somebody follows you on Twitter or your friend mentions something. It is it's a stroke of luck to like make a podcast and then to find it as an audience member once yeah. it exists. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Absolutely. You mentioned TV stuff um, and r- 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 writing for TV. I'm not sure what all you can talk about because I know there's a bunch of NDAs and, and stuff like that. But um, what, what has that experience been, 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 been like for you? Um, when is this going up on your channel? Uh, this will probably go live next Monday, which is uh, the uh, I think yeah. that's at the start <laughs> okay. of May. Let me thing here. Yeah, okay. May third. Yeah, May third. Okay, I'm gonna have to keep it vague then, just in case the press release doesn't come out in time. Ooh, okay. uh, so I do have a press release coming out uh, for something I sold to a major streamer. Uh, it's an original idea. It's not based on an IP. It's sort of based on, loosely on my life, a dramedy, with some okay. big what, what they call auspices. I, I, there's big names attached. So this is the first one I've ever done with big names attached. So it, 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 it'll, it'll, that thing will come out. That's interesting, interesting. because uh, it's, it was like a throwaway. It was my agent's idea. It's, it's not something I came up with. My agent came up, like, he knew I did something. And then he called me about it. And he said, is this you? I go, yeah, it's, yeah, it's me. And, and he goes, <laughs> why aren't we taking this out? And I'm like, uh, we could take this out? He goes, yeah, we could take this out. <laughs> and next thing you know, I'm, I'm meeting this, this, this famous comedic actor that I that I highly respect and we're on FaceTime with each other for three hours. Amazing. Talking <laughs> about his life and my life. We connected. Next thing we know, I get my, my agency, ICM, they go, yeah, he wants to do it with you. Let's let's do it. And then we take it out around town. I'm meeting all these uh it's it's when you Kyle, when you ask about what's it like, I feel like that you know you see those old Hollywood movies where the guy from a small town goes to Hollywood and gets taken advantage of because all the like <laughs> I feel like that except I'm I'm lucky to not have been <laughs> been taken Perfect. advantage of yet but i was still wide-eyed mm-hmm. and you know uh, during during covid the uh, uh the pandemic all the hollywood people who live down there and are used to it they're all like thank god we don't have to drive around la and go to the in-person meetings anymore but i guess if i lived down there i'd think the same thing but i loved going down there i got to walk into like every yeah. office like i was at hbo looking at the big posters um I, I took a photo and then i got yelled at by the security guard and my manager's looking at me like what what are you i'm like oh sorry you know i, I, I go it's into like, nbc like look at the tony awards and all that kind of stuff i go into uh, amc and all these places and i'm like i'm like and hulu and and amazon and netflix and i'm like wow look at this and amazon netflix they had free food i'm like jesus christ i'm like <laughs> piling it on wow. so i'm that i'm like I, I felt like such a small town guy in that and it's it's you know, because it's Hollywood is mythical, but I, I like part. I like being part of that story, right? So yeah. I'll probably yeah. get tired of that part, but right now I'm enjoying that part. Uh, well, pre-pandemic, right? So that part I enjoyed, and then doing this pitching where I go around, uh, as I was saying, uh, meeting these producers uh, pe- and, and people that have respect their work. I respect their work so much, and then I get to pitch them my idea, and then having one of them in the ro- one the one of the producers in the room said, "I want it. I want it now." And so I had to cancel the rest of my meetings awesome. and say, you know, oh! which was awesome. Um, and I hadn't had that feeling since the black tapes and we feeling. sold it in the room. Oh, the black tapes and we sold it to NBC. I was late. Luckily, we had a showrunner who's in charge. Uh, Matt Arnold, who's done huh? his shows before, has a good relationship with them. We we're supposed to meet in an office at Universal Studios. Uh, it's called 10 Universal Studio. Mm-hmm. My Uber driver dropped me off at Universal Studios, the theme park. So I'm wandering around the theme oh park. My God. Looking for the office oh, for this pitch meeting, and then I'm, t- <laughs> and then I'm going to the number security guards. Is I'm n- number ten around here. <laughs> you guys, I was I was lined up at the info booth, waiting my turn with all these kids and adults looking for Harry Potter or whatever. And I go up and I'm like, "Hey, uh, uh, do you know where this meeting is?" I go, "I'm meeting some people there." They go, "About what?" I go, "I'm pitching my show, The Black Tapes, to NBC." They go, "What?" <laughs> I'm like, "We don't know." And so I w- I walked into every tall building I saw because they've called me. They're like, "Where are you?" <laughs> and they go, "We're in the tall building." I'm like, "Okay, I'll look." And then when they figure it out, oh my God, the Canadian is so lost. The Canadian is up the hill <laughs> and they're at the bottom of the hill. So I had to run down. I ran. Thank God wow. I'm, I'm a runner, Ooh. but I ran. I showed up, you know, in the LA heat, I showed up sweaty mid pitch. Like Matt was already pitching. I missed the intros. I should have sat next to him, sweating buckets. That's and a great the story. End, then we did the q and I was able to, by that point, have like 
you know, thank God the water was there. And I'm, uh, by the Q&A, that's my, <laughs> that's my specialty. And yeah. then at the end, they, they applauded. They applauded Matt, not me. And then uh, they go, all right, that's a sale. And we just sat there. Because we had, we had pitched like, like, you got to understand, we pitched everybody. When I mentioned those places, HBO, AMC, uh, Netflix, uh, uh, NBC, ABC, every place. Um, what they say is thank you, and then we leave. Yeah, here's where we are at NBC, and they go, well, we, we, yeah, we'll take it. And we're like, D was that a sale? <laughs> they go, yes. And we're about to leave. And they go, one more time, can we hear? We just sold it in the room. They go, yes, you sold it in the room. Go celebrate. And we're like, <laughs> and then our agents Amazing. like hitting us, like, shut up. And we, we got up, got into the hallway, they closed the door, and we quietly just hugged each other and bounced down the hallway Aww. like this. Because <laughs> we, we so sold good. it. But so, so those little things. So I hadn't done that since the black tapes years prior. And so now, you know, uh, last September is when I sold this, I guess. Last September, I sold in the room to this uh, production company. So that's the comedy. And now I have, um, I, I, I had a podcast, a, a new horror one. It was going to be my next horror series. Um, okay. set, set, all I could say is it's set in the early 80s. Um, and it's really scary. It's really disturbing. And I, mm, I, I'm I sold getting it to major a... arcade vibes in this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not that. It's it's about politics and stuff like that. But it's it's pretty cool. Uh, oh. I'm very proud of this idea. Scary stuff. Uh, and indeed. then um, I sold it to a pro podcast production company. And as we're doing the negotiations, I was pitching another idea to a, a very well known uh, a TV network. And then they said they said no to my idea. I came close. But then my agent told them, you know, Paul has this other idea that he just sold as a podcast. Uh, and then they let me pitch it and they go, yeah, we want it. Uh, mm -hmm. and so we took it back from the podcast company because I don't I didn't need wow. to create it anymore as a podcast, as an IP. Like now it's just a TV series. Um, and thank yeah. God they thank God they took a long time making the negotiation. <laughs> also, I have to do the podcast first and then this. Um, so, yeah, I'm writing that right now. Like a, as we speak, that's the what that's what I'm in development on the horror. OK. And the comedy, I start pretty soon um so it's been a, it's been a ton of fun and the guy i'm doing uh this one with the horror uh That's exciting, yeah. he's my manager his name is guyman cassidy he used to be the manager for the guys who ran game of thrones uh he was the manager oh, okay. for the guys oh. who created the terror so he's 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 helped start a lot terror of shows wonderful yeah with, with uh, and you know with the with the um game of thrones guys benioff and weiss you know they didn't have a ton of experience uh going in for and, sure. and yeah. that, that's me so my manager is very good at taking people like us uh, and sh showing us the ropes, like he's helping me with my pilot, and he's got a way of making his ideas sound like mine. <laughs> like he'll he'll throw out an idea, can this be scarier? And then I'm come up and I, I say something. He goes, you know what, Paul, your idea to make this scary is perfect. And I'm like, that was your idea, man. <laughs> <laughs> so he's one of those guys that's very good. Like he's so good at his job. Um, so I, awesome. I'm I, again, I feel like I'm in a situation where uh, it's I I'm set up for success. On, on these things you know knock on wood you know i know i know it's a lottery out there it's it's it, you know yeah, yeah. there's a lot of great ideas that get passed on for whatever reason uh you know it's 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 all it's very subjective uh who gets chosen to get on tv um but you know it's it's uh it's fun being in the game in the conversation for sure uh well awesome. we are almost running a a out of time so melissa do you have one or two or two more things so we can wrap it up here uh Ah, are there fa uh, any favorite podcasts you've been listening to, audio dramas or not? What are your recommendations? Uh, there's a there's a relatively new one. Uh, I think I'm saying it right, Temujin. It's an all Asian cast, and it's it's like a fantasy oh. type. But it's the sound design's incredible. Uh, it's, it's the acting, everything. It's I think because of uh, that uh, that type of world uh, that's that specific. I haven't heard too much of, so it's refreshing to me. Yeah. Uh, to my ears anyways uh and apart from that um uh, i'm almost ashamed to say i haven't, haven't been listening to too much audio drama i've been i've been so working so hard on the tv side i've been listening to just to like um uh writing podcasts right like okay. like <laughs> like uh, uh screaming into the hollywood abyss where, where well-known showrunner <laughs> showrunners tell you about their biggest failures and what they've learned from it and it's very awesome. inspirational wow. all that kind of stuff um yeah and i've been listening to the ajima show because uh it's a it's two korean people uh to okay, to okay. two queer korean people talking about being korean in america and all the it, they're very funny they're hilarious they're two comedians and so they're uh, I, I just find that on weekends to be very refreshing uh it just yeah. it, it feeds my soul that's wonderful 
<laughs> wonderful stuff. Good. Do you, do, you, do you have things outside of podcasts like TV shows or movies you've in, enjoyed recently that you that, that have stuck w- with you? So my wife and I last night started, we just planned to watch For All Mankind, this television series uh, mm-hmm. yes. uh, on, on Apple TV. Uh, that was the plan. We ended up on episode four, late into the night. I'm, I don't like going late into the night, but it was that good. It's, and I only watched it because all these TV writers are talking about how great the ending of season two was, that they stuck the landing. And yeah. uh, not to point fingers at myself or anybody else, but sticking the landing on a series is very important to me. <laughs> to, to, to mm-hmm. Anyone that does it, I highly, highly respect. So I, I wanted to uh, uh, get there, but man, what a, what a series so far. Um, Interesting. That one. Okay. And I, I, I just binged Shadow and Bone. Uh, I've that heard one of it. on I don't Netflix. know what that is, though. Sorry, I've 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 heard p- p- people mentioning it, but I, I'm not f- f- familiar. It's from Eric Heiser, uh, who's who I think he won an Academy Award or at least a nomination for his movie Arrival. Uh, okay. Veteran mm. screenwriter, he's got, he's got so much stuff under his belt, so he's doing this one, and and he uh, he's adapted a series of novels. But I think it, I think what he did was he 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 uh, amalgamated two. The author's two different novel series, uh, one involving the crows, one involving the shadow and bone. I think that's how the. Uh, I, I don't know the books at all. I it might be mangling it up, but it's it involved two different universes and mashing it together. And I I don't know what the books are like, but the result is masterful. It's it's a, it's a it's a lesson in storytelling. Um, I I think you had to. They couldn't. Uh, they didn't have the budget for big stars, so it was all on the casting. And I don't know who the casting director was. But holy crap, it's, some, it's probably the best casting I've seen on a TV series since Game of Thrones. You know when someone shows up on the screen oh. on Game of Thrones and you're like, that, that's, that's not an actor, that's that person. That, yeah, yeah. Every single person on the screen is that person. Um, that's Shadow and Bone. Every single person, I, I, don't see an, I don't see actors. It's weird going to their Instagram and seeing the actors. That's so cool. It, it shocks, it, that's how good they are. Every, si- every single person uh, on, on that screen is just master, just everyone's so good. The costuming, everything um storytelling and, and you know uh heiser i looked up the writers they're so diverse and heiser uh, in, in interviews talks about how um he's not doing it just to be diverse he's doing it because he wants better storytelling and so he would mm-hmm. lean on certain uh he had one writer I, I forget her name but i think i think she's uh half asian just like the lead character uh so whenever he had something about her he had to rely on, uh, go to her and say you write that now like you tell us what it is like to be in that skin uh growing up in this place where you're bullied for certain reasons and he he was very open about that so it was very it's very um inspiring to hear a major writer uh talk like that about how he he's not using diver- d- diversity as a label as a badge of honor <laughs> <laughs> to, to get into the trades like it's, it's it's something that you have to do if you want to tell stories now yeah yeah mhm right and i would br- i would i would bring that into audio drama um audio drama that's something the great thing about the new way this wave of audio drama is that there's more diverse storytelling which i never didn't get a chance to talk about right um i I, in hindsight i wish i used you know because terry and me is like a it's a white guy and an asian guy making the black tapes i wish in hindsight i had brought in more of me uh like asianness into the story i didn't even think of that uh Mm because pre-back tapes as someone who wanted to get into hollywood I've always written from a white vantage point, like the mainstream vantage point, because, you know, if, if, if I have Korean stories, no one wants to hear it before Black sure, Tapes, yeah. that, that era. Uh, but then a whole bunch of things started happening where diverse verse, people want to hear diverse stories. Um, I got to do that in the big loop, but I, I wish, I think in hindsight, Black Tapes would have been a bit more uh, vibrant had I, because <laughs> you don't know the, the lead character in Black Tapes, Lori Henry, she's half Chinese. Um, Oh. I, sh- I, I should have I should have brought that out. I, I don't you know, it's it's it just didn't even enter my head to do that. It didn't enter Terry's head, didn't enter Lori's wow, head yeah. or Christian's head, our, our, our lead actors. We never even thought of that because uh, that so so pre pre 2015, that, that's where our heads were at, like the culture. Like, yeah, this yeah. is we tell these stories and, and the default is the the the, the white character. Um, it's it's fascinating to me that a Korean guy and a half Chinese woman didn't even think to do that. <laughs> interesting interesting stuff. and it's no one's fault but but it's but maybe mine it's it's like i i should have there's pushed always on something that. though but, there, there, yeah, there's yeah. something like i i just wish if i went back and did that one thing maybe i would have done it this way you know so 
yeah, if I had these, the, the, this lens back then, right? But, you know, but I, I, know, I know that now. So it, that yeah. it's a powerful tool for storytelling. Good stuff. Mm-hmm. Paul, thank you so much uh, for giving us your t- time and jo- jo- joining us here on the podcast. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? Um, yeah, on Twitter and Instagram, it's at, at Mr. Paul Bay, uh, just MR, uh, Paul Bay. And uh, yeah, a big loop podcast.com and the black tapes podcast.com or wherever you, wherever you find, wherever you get your podcasts. There you go. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. And Melissa, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at WilkyWit. That's W I L K Y W I T. And listen to my other podcast, Saturday Morning Obscurities, where me and my brother Jams talk about weird old kids' shows you feel like only you remember. Good stuff. Uh, you can f- find me at Yo Kyle Springer on Twitter. Uh, if you guys w- w- want to stay up to date with all of the shows that we do here at the Whatnots, we are at the Whatnots on Twitter. Uh, so go like, sh- share, subscribe. You guys know the deal with all of that stuff. Uh, and that wraps us up for this week. We will be back next week. Uh, so once again, thank you, Paul. This has been a blast. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much mm-hmm. for having me. Indeed. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>